Good morning, or good afternoon, whatever the case may be. Hey guys, and welcome to another great Wednesday. Actually, it's a pretty cold and rainy Wednesday, but you know, it's a Wednesday, and it's the Wednesday before spring break, so that means it's a great Wednesday. Today we're going to talk about non-Mendelian genetics. So, where were the places where Mendel got it all wrong? Where did he, as Queen Amadala might say, assume too much? So today... That's what we're going to explore. So, Mendel's assumptions. Let's go ahead and get started. Now, of course, when we talk about Mendel's assumptions, we got to give the guy some credit. I mean, he was operating without any kind of knowledge of genetics whatsoever. He is called the father of genetics. He was basically making this stuff up as he went along. So, we need to make sure that we give him credit where credit is due. Now that credit has been given, let's trash his theories. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, his theories are pretty good, but Mendel did kind of skew his data a little bit, but maybe not including all the data points that didn't match with his theory. Ugh. And uh, Mendel made a couple of more logic assumptions. And so Mendel assumed, first off, that the genes he was working with were on separate chromosomes. Um, uh, I, I, in fact, let me say this, that all genes were on separate chromosomes. That will turn out to be a lie because, in fact, as we should already be able to intuit, some genes are on the same chromosome. Uh, so chromosome 1 might not just code for your eye color. It might also code for the length of your nose. Um, and so, you know, there might be more than one gene uh, for different traits on the same chromosome. Um, and that's going to change things because if you remember the law of independent assortment works because those genes he was looking at were on different chromosomes because flower color was on a different chromosome than plant height and so on. So anyway, that was his first assumption. All genes were on separate chromosomes. Of course, he didn't know what a chromosome was, so he just thought all genes are separate from each other, which is not true. Anyway, the second assumption that Mendel made is that all traits are coded for by one gene. Uh, in other words, there was one specific switch, and we have since discovered that that is not the case at all. There are dozens, sometimes hundreds of switches that determine a single trait, and we'll talk about that. It's called a polygenic trait, and that is going to trash a lot of his results as well. Um, so all traits are coded for by one gene is not true. The last assumption that I'll say that Mendel made, although he made some more, but these are the important ones. The last assumption that Mendel made um, is that all of these genes, um, I guess I'll say it this way, uh, that uh, one gene or one type of gene um, cannot affect the other. In, in other words, that um, you know the inheritance of one allele uh, won't affect the inheritance of the other allele. And that is also incorrect because... Uh, some can be on the same chromosome, and also in epistasis, we'll learn that uh, some alleles actually have to do with, um, they have to go together with another trait, and if they don't, uh, then they won't be expressed. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to epistasis. Okay, so these are some of Mendel's assumptions. Let's go ahead and show him where he was wrong. Non-Mendelian genetics. So when we talk about non-Mendelian genetics, what we're essentially referring to uh, is patterns of inheritance that don't follow the predicted Mendelian ratios. Uh, and some examples of those predicted ratios are the 3 to 1 uh, golden ratio for uh, the monohybrid cross. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 uh, golden ratio, whoa, ratio for the dihybrid cross. Right, so that is not going to work out the same way this way. We're, in fact, going to get uh, a very different pattern of inheritance from non-Mendelian genetics. Don't worry, though. All problems on your AP exam and all problems on any test thing that I give you, or it won't be a test, but any quiz that I give you, um, that will all be uh, Mendelian unless otherwise stated. Okay, so I'm not going to throw a bunch of non-Mendelian problems at you and be like, solve these without letting you know You'll know when they're Mendelian or non-Mendelian, so don't worry about that. Okay? The same rules apply for all Mendelian ratios. Okay, so let's go, and, and also, sorry, one more thing. Uh, what we learned about with the, um, the uh, homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and homozygous recessive, okay, uh, those terms still apply, 
So they still mean the same thing, but um, you're going to see that the phenotypic expression is going to change. And we'll see what that means in a second. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about, the first pattern of inheritance that deviates from middles is called incomplete dominance. So you know that if a gene is dominant or allele is dominant over another allele, that means that its phenotype will be expressed over the other one. So what do we mean by incomplete dominance? That means that one allele is somewhat dominant over the other, but not entirely. And so some of the other allele will still sort of leak out into the phenotype. And so it's going to make a blended phenotype. I like to think of incomplete dominance as being blended. Because when you blend two things together, like paint, they mix together, they make um, a whole different thing, right? And so what we're actually going to see is when we take this red flower, red is incompletely dominant to white, uh, this red flower, big R, big R, and then this white flower, WW, whoa, notice they're using that different notation we talked about before. Um, and you mix them together, all the RW flowers, the ones that have one copy of the white allele and the red, are going to be pink. Because the red is going to be somewhat dominant, so it's going to mostly show, but some of the white is still going to be in there, and so it's going to kind of mix together and make this awesome pink color. We can see the same thing over here, but I wanted to show you there are three different ways that you could properly write this. You could use RW, and you could use CRCR. The C is just a stand-in letter. It doesn't actually mean anything, um, but the uh, or at least and it does, but I'm just going to say it's just a, a filler letter for now. Um, but these right here, the big R, big R, it's the same exact thing. They're just written as uh, exponents above the C's. And the same with the W. So RW, still RW, still pink, just with these C's. Why would you ever do that? Well, it actually gets more um, useful to do that notation in, when we talk about codominant blood types. So we'll get to that in a moment. Um, but just know this is another proper way of writing it. And this is another proper way of writing it. So we could treat it just like a normal Mendelian notation and say that the dominant is big R and the recession is little. And then just say it's going to complete uh, big R, little r, or all the heterozygotes or hybrids are going to be that intermediate phenotype. Okay, so all hybrids and incomplete dominance are going to have a third and separate phenotype from the others. If we were to have two uh, red flowers mate together, they would still make red offspring, all red. If we had two whites mixed together, they would make all white offspring. It's only when we have hybrids and incomplete dominance that they're going to display a third and intermediate mixed phenotype. Codominance, on the other hand, is very different. Now, I apologize for the pictures for codominance because I had a tough time trying to find any good pictures online for codominance planet square. It's just crazy how I was unable to find those. It might be some of the search restrictions on this laptop, but anyway. So codominance, if we're looking at codominance, what that means is that two different alleles are equally as dominant. And so they don't fight over dominance. They just co um they both show their dominance at the same time, or their phenotype. Okay, so um, over here in these chickens, if we have a white chicken and white is dominant, and we have a black chicken and whoop, black is dominant, then that means that when they have offspring together, those WBs, again, notice they're using the two different letters, those WBs here are going to be speckled, black and white. So it's not like mixing. It's not like they created gray chickens, which I know it might look like that because this picture is super blurry, but those are supposed to be speckled, black and white chickens. And so the idea is that instead of mixing like an incomplete dominance, they just both express at the same time. Another example is roan calves or cattle. So here we can see that different notation here, the one with the, the letter and then the exponent. So uh, here we have the red bull, and it's just purebred red. It's dominant. We have the purebred white. It's also dominant. We mix those together, and they make roan calves, which are speckled um, brown and white or red and white. Uh, and so that's going to be our codominant phenotype. So codominance also makes a third phenotype, as we can also see down here in these flowers. We have the same flower thing as before, but this time instead of being incompletely dominant, they're codominant, and we get this speckled flower rather than getting a pink one. So this is how codominance works, and it's often uh, confused with incomplete. Just remember, incomplete is like mixing paint. You take red and white, it makes pink. Codominance is like painting with both colors on the same canvas, but not mixing them. So we paint with red and we paint with white, and we end up getting the speckled pattern. The codominance and complete dominance are the first two patterns of inheritance most common to non-Mendelian genetics. And of course, they're going to skew his results, his ratios, because here, what you would end up getting uh, is you would end up getting 100% of this phenotype if you did this cross. But then let's imagine really quick. I just want to do a, a really quick problem here. Let's imagine that you had um, the, uh, we'll use the chickens example here. Let's imagine that you took two, uh, 
speckled chickens. And let's say that you cross those speckled chickens together. And you created a Punnett square. Do, 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 do. Okay. So you create a Punnett square. Yeah. And. 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 Da -da. Okay. So now let's see what's going to happen to our phenotypic ratios. Okay. We get. Da -da 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 -do. Sorry. Okay, cool. There we go. All right, so now what happened to our phenotypic ratios? Well, the first phenotype we can have is white, and we have one out of four, or 25%. Whoa, 25%. Uh, and then we have uh, two that are speckled, right? So that's white and black, so it's going to be two out of four, and that's going to equal 50%. And then we have uh, one fourth, which is the dominant black, and that's going to give us 25%. And whoa, those are not the three to one Mendelian ratios we would expect out of a monohybrid cross like this, right? So that's what we mean when we say this skews his ratios and results. Okay, so polygenic traits, what does that mean? That means that um, more than one allele codes for your genes. So before when we're talking about it, of course, W and B. Uh, they represent um, two different versions of the same gene, right? They're the white and black alleles for feather color. But this is assuming that there's only one allele or gene for feather color, and that there's just two different versions of it that can produce white or black or when mixed together speckled. But polygenic inheritance is far more common. Most of our traits are polygenic, such as our eye color, which is a terrifying graph, or our skin color. And we can see that there are three different alleles that actually encode for our skin color. And in different combinations of these, we get different skin colors. And over here, the same is true. We have different combinations that can give us different eye colors. And so polygenic is just saying that basically we don't just always have one gene for one trait. It just doesn't work that way. Our bodies are far more complex than that and require a lot more genetic information and control. Okay, which leads us to epistasis. So epistasis, if you remember, the third um, kind of assumption of Mendel was that one gene cannot affect the expression of the other. Well, that's actually very false. Epistasis, when we look at epistasis, what it means is that there are uh, two genes at work. There's one gene that does whatever in the heck it's supposed to do. So in here, it's fur color in mice, so black or brown. And then there's another gene that's associated with it that goes together with it. And that gene has to do with helping to distribute that black or brown color to the mouse's fur. OK, so these two have to go together. It's like this is the paint, and this is the painter. If you have the paint without the painter, well, nothing gets painted. If you have the painter without the paint, well, you know, obviously nothing gets painted. Um, so that's the way that this works. And so let's take a look at it up here. So let's say we take. Um, a hybrid, uh, two hybrids, we do a dihybrid cross in mice. They're both black, so we can assume black is the dominant allele and brown is the recessive. And let's go ahead and show what happens. So here, with these guys, we can see these mice are all going to be black because they have the black a dominant allele, uh, and they have the dominant coat deposition. Now, to deposit something, of course, means to kind of drop it off. So in, in other words, you can think of this as it being the painting gene, so the gene that actually paints the mouse colors black. So they have the dominant, which means that it does get successfully painted. So all these are going to be successfully painted, painted black. Now, what happened over here to these guys? Well, these guys had the dominant black allele, but they had two copies of the recessive coat deposition. And what that means is that uh, that protein is now unable to paint with that black paint. It's basically the painter isn't there. And so the mice become white, a third phenotype. OK, over here, we can see that these guys were painted brown because they had the brown, uh, two copies of the recessive brown allele and at least one copy of the dominant painter allele or deposition allele. But here, again, they are white because they received not just the recessive brown, but also the recessive coat deposition. So epistasis can drastically change um, these uh, ratios. And if we take a look at this here, we can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. OK, we could still count nine black, OK, and then three brown, OK? But it's going to be nine to three to three. And there's not even, or it's nine to three to four, excuse me, because uh, there's four white. And there's not even going to be that extra phenotype there. There's not going to be, you know, normally we would have nine to three to three to one. Here we just have nine to three to four. 
So it really changes and messes that up. Another thing that can happen, which uh, I didn't actually think about to make a slide for, but there's another thing that can happen, which is lethality. Okay, so, um, and I'm actually going to add this onto this epistasis slide. So another thing that can happen is, instead of just not having the coat change colors, sometimes uh, the gene that is connected to the color gene or whatever, sometimes the connected gene, the epistatic one, can be lethal if it's double recessive. And so in that case, what would happen is that all these individuals, instead of being white, they would be dead. <laughs> Uh, and that can happen. Uh, there are alleles that when, they're, uh, when they are um, inherited in the recessive manner, uh, then they are lethal. Or sometimes it can happen with the dominant as well. So instead, these guys would just die. Uh, and that's, so that also can skew that relationship, because then in that case, what happened is we would end up getting this. We would just get 9 to 3 instead of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. It would super change what we were expecting to have happen here. So anyway, epistasis uh, and um, gene lethality, these are also things that can screw up uh, Mendel's inheritance uh, and make it so that those ratios don't come out the way they should. Oops. OK, linked genes. That's the next thing I wanted to talk to you about. So what does it mean for a gene to be linked? OK, so we said before one of Mendel's assumptions was that all genes were on separate chromosomes or in separate areas, and they could all independently assort from each other. That's not true. So this is what Mendel normally would assume up here. OK, so Mendel would normally assume that in a typical precursor cell, that could become gametes. So this cell is one of our precursors that will undergo meiosis to create four sex cells that in each precursor, the two alleles we're looking at, alleles A and B, are on separate chromosomes or separate areas. This allows them to undergo this process of crossing over, where we can see that um, the big A and the big B can be inherited together, or the little a and the little b can be inherited together, or we could cross over and have the big B be inherited with the little a, or the little b be inherited with the big A. So we have all these different combinations. And that's what we were talking about before when we were doing that almost FOIL-like method before, right? So if we do the AABB, and we were doing that FOIL method before, if you remember, we took you know, this A and distributed it to this B, and then this A and distributed it to that B, and then this one to this one, whoops, this one to this one, uh, and then that one to that one, OK? Right? And so we had all these different combinations that we could get out of this, right? So we had. Uh, we had this, we had uh, this, we had, um, oops, sorry, we had this, and we had this, right? So those were all the possible gametes or sex cells. I'll go ahead and, well, I would circle them, but I don't know if I can. <laughs> These are each of the four gametes or sex cells that could be produced by that original precursor cell, uh, which is this one right here, right, or this one right here. Right, okay, so we have all these different combos, and they're due to this crossing over. This is what allows that to happen. But what happens when they're on the same chromosome? So notice here, A and B are on the same chromosomes. There's only one way they can be inherited. They can't undergo crossing over. It's just not going to happen. And so here we can either have big A and big B, or little a and little b. And that's going to reduce the amount of the number of results we can actually have. That means that we only really have certain phenotypes here. Here, we have four different phenotypes that are possible. Here, we have two. Okay, These three will have the same phenotype because they have at least one copy of the big B allele. Okay, And these guys will have the recessive phenotype. They won't have these intermediates here. So linked genes really reduce the amount of genetic diversity that you can have. Um, but sometimes they're essential. Sometimes they need to be inherited together because if they don't, the organism will develop properly. So here's um, here's what we can use with that. So this guy that figured out the link genes, his name was Morgan, Thomas Morgan, and he was actually an undergraduate um, at school, which is pretty cool to think about. He was a he was not a freshman, I don't think, but he was you know he was in his first four years, and uh, he realized that there were some organisms, some offspring that were born to parents that um, had uh, a phenotype that was different than either parent. So if you look down here, we can see, to explain this, we have a gray and normal fly, and then we have a black fly with little teeny wings that are called vestigial. If you remember, that means that the wings are no longer being used. So we have this gray normal fly with normal wings, and a black vestigial fly with vestigial wings, and we mate them together, 
And here we get some offspring that are gray and normal, just like the mom. Some offspring that are black and vestigial, just like the dad. But then we get these guys. We get gray vestigials and black normals. Now that's interesting because these guys don't represent these in terms of the genes that were inherited, or at the very least, they represent the same genes but in a different combo, a new and novel combo. We call this recombinant offspring because their alleles were recombined. I want you to think about this. When crossing ha over happens within uh, certain individuals, notice here, crossing over can only happen um, between the non-linked genes. So here, these, this is one homologous chromosome, this is another. We can only have crossing over happen between the arms of these two different chromosomes. But notice that the other chromatids, the ones that aren't crossing over, always remain the same. These genes on theirs are linked. So they're going to have the same phenotype as the parent because they don't have a choice. And only these guys are going to become recombinant. Now what Thomas Morgan figured out, and in terms of what, what, I mean, what is important about this, this is actually an amazing discovery because what, what Thomas Morgan figured out, excuse me, is that um, you could take that frequency of recombinants, you could figure out how many recombinants there were, and you could actually come up with a number that could help show you the distance between chromosomes uh, on, uh, excuse me, the distance between genes on a chromosome. So just to clarify this, if we assume that recombinants can only happen because of crossing over, and that crossing over can only happen if alleles are on different chromosomes, then the number of recombinants that we get will really tell us, what this is actually telling us, is how much crossing over can occur. And really what that is telling us is how likely, or excuse me, um, how, uh, let's see, how linked <laughs> are these genes to each other? Okay, are they on the same chromosome or not? If they're on the same chromosome, we should only get the normal or the parental phenotypes. If they're on different chromosomes, allowing for crossing over, we can get recombinants. So how linked are they? And this actually tells us, this can tell us something of the relative distance between chromosomes. If they're very close together, in other words, there are very few recombinants, then we can maybe assume they're on the same chromosome. If they're farther apart from one another, however, okay, like these two, it might indicate that they are uh, not on the same chromosome, that they aren't linked, and that they can undergo crossing over. Okay, so pretty cool stuff that he was able to figure out.